Today, I wanted to show you how to make five simple augmented reality projects. So the five projects are plotting, drawing, image manipulation, iframes, and then a globe is the, the five projects we're going to work on today. So the process for building these is you take a canvas, you put it into a 3D mesh, put that 3D mesh into a 3D scene, and then you put that into a WebXR scene. And to get interactivity, you basically follow the chart backwards. So you start with the camera position, which is from WebXR. You put that into the scene. You find out where the position of the mesh is you find out which position it intersects with on that mesh, and then you click that onto the canvas. So interactivity is basically the opposite of this graph. Er so the first project that we're going to look at is chart.js in WebXR. And so we have this chart that is animated, and it's getting the information from the Y position of our phone. So if we lift up and down our phone, that'll change the values. And so you could attach this to other more interesting information, but this kind of highlights what's valuable with it. And then you can also do ray casting. So if we click on on these different bars, there will be information that gets displayed from them. So we can actively see what our Y position was at each of those points. And we'll start by just initializing some quantities. So we need to have a scene, a ray caster, our mouse, we'll have a camera, a renderer, uh, we will set up those renders, we have to enable it so that XR is enabled. And then we'll set some parameters for the ray caster and get a canvas. And then we will do our make graph. So this is a bunch of code that's mostly just configurations for the graph where if you're doing chart JS, you can just see how it's put together there. Then we have our add planar graph. So this is where we are putting together our 3D plane object. And so the two parts that are a little bit important is that we are going to be attaching our canvas to the texture and the texture we are going to be attaching to the map of the material. And then we are also going to make the material double sided as well. And then we will attach that to the plane and the plane we will position and then we will update the materials. So one thing that some, unless you say that it's a video texture, it won't update its map automatically. And so you'll need to say that it's being updated. So then we have to do that updating. And then we will be adding in the values to our graph. So our graph is the current distribution. And we will be adding different values to that so that it moves along. And then we are going to be creating a function that gets the local position of a world vector. So if we have a vector in the world, it'll get the local position with a given object. And that given object is going to be our plane. And the point that comes comes from the ray caster. And that will give us an idea of where it is clicking on the plane. And so with that information, we can make our click canvas function with the point and the canvas and click it so that we can dispatch an event to the canvas. So the canvas will be located off screen. And we're basically just creating a custom click event and then clicking it using that. And then we're just attaching event listeners to it. And that's basically how it goes. So most of these have a similar form where you are clicking things off screen using an on touch to ray caster to canvas click creating a mouse event that will do the clicking for you. So the second project is drawing in augmented reality. And so it basically, we just have a canvas and then we can draw on it however we want. And the canvas is attached to the reference frame of the world. And it is kind of interesting how this differs from drawing on your phone with like a camera in the background. Since the frame is actually attached to the world and not our phone, it has this weird stabilizing effect. And I find it easier to draw, which I just think is kind of an interesting I wouldn't have expected that. Also really good for being able to do quick mockups. And it's a good way of understanding how accurate our ray casting is because it gives a very clear representation of that. So we have a very similar startup for drawing. So we have, we define our scene, the camera, the render, and we also get a canvas. We get the canvas, we put the canvas into a plane or we define our plane function. We, hit, we define a world function. We get some, our ray casters and our touches and our mouse events. So this is the drawing part. So basically how we're doing this is we are just doing some HTML canvas stuff where we save a previous point, we have our current point, we draw a line between those, and we do that iteratively every time the mouse moves. And then we change our click canvas event to be a little bit different from some of the others. Uh, and then we just have the adding of all of the objects in the end. The third project is implementing Fabric.js inside of WebXR. So Fabric.js is an image manipulation library for JavaScript, and it has a bunch of different functionalities. But one of the most straightforward ones is that it allows you to move different images around and kind of change their orientation and stuff. So this can be a really nice way of orienting different objects. And if you wanted to make some sort of like quick mock-up on an object, it would be a really great way of doing that. So things like if you have a bunch of pictures and you want to see how they would look in different areas, 
areas. If you had some sort of uploading thing, you could move those, you could do that all in WebXR and see how it would look from different angles and then do it in real world. So it's really nice to have these kind of quick mock-up tools. For Fabric, the starting code is very similar where we just define a few sets of objects and then we put our camera and our render together and then we will have a raycaster this time and we'll just define some of the things we've done previously with the get canvas. For the actual Fabric part, you have to get an image that is part of your HTML script already and then you can create a canvas and then you start attaching images to those canvases and the canvas will actually create some extra elements. So we just have to move those out of the way so that they are not in WebEx Sara's way, but they will, they'll be somewhere off screen so that we can click them. Then here we are defining a set of objects and just creating their parameters. So a fabric image will use the image in the element, and then it'll use the parameters here to orient that image and we will scale it. And then we'll just do this a few times so that we have a few different images to go on. So if you wanted to change the images, you would load up a bunch of different images here and you could create a helper function or something to make this a little bit more straightforward. And then we're just adding the planar, the worlds to local, the ray caster, and then the touch events. And then we are doing the canvas, the click canvas. So there is one thing that I wanted to note that's a little bit special here. So Fabric.js doesn't deal well with touch events. It deals better with mouse events. And so normally, there's a process where there'll be a cascading effect where most events will lead to click events. But when you're doing some of this stuff, then sometimes those cascades don't happen. And so basically, we're just going to redefine the touch events to be most events so that it doesn't mess with the library's internals because the Fabric.js is a little bit of an older library. And then we base it, and then we continue on with our clicking of the off screen event or the off screen canvas. And we're just adding all the event listeners and then adding the objects and adding some lighting. So our fourth project is an interactive globe. And so you can see how it's all dimensions. And if you click on different things, it'll give you the information that we've stored from those values. And all the information right now is just random values. But in the future, you could see how that could end up. You could change that to something else. Yeah. We start with a similar process where we define our camera and our render and some extra things. And then we add in our get canvas and we will add a little bit of a plugin that will color our values before we do any of the charting. And then we are loading up a add on to chart JS, a topology type add on where we can kind of plot different things. And we'll just put in some really basic values. So we are just randomizing the values for each country, but you could actually put in more interesting information you could add in well basically any sort of actual values would be interesting here like GDP per capita or anything this geography plugin only actually activates events when they are within the chart area and so one thing that we are changing about this one in particular is we are switching our material to a different one so rather than having the mesh basic material we switch to this and that just gives us a better coloration so because we are using a sphere in this one we have to unwrap our value use onto that sphere. And one of the things that's a little bit confusing about the spherical transformation that we are using is generally 3D cameras from the user's perspective use a different coordinate system where Z is what would normally be considered Y. And so we're just going to flip those two around to get the right orientation for our spherical coordinates. <laughs> but yeah, just to, the reason why the Z and Y are flipped there. So when we're doing our sphere to plane, basically this converts the world vector into a local vector from the spheres perspective. And then it unwraps that into theta and phi. And then those theta and phi's are changed to be one to zero. I click on our plane further down. But yeah, the process of unwrapping the sphere is actually a little bit simpler than people might expect. Then we have a very similar ray caster. And then the differences between the on start and on touch are that we are changing the world plane to sphere to plane. And then we define our the rest of things in a very similar way. We change the X and Y's to be a little bit different. Uh, and then the rest of this is very similar to all the code we've done previously. So it's mostly just the spherical transform that might catch people off a little bit. So our fourth example is using iframes within WebXR. And so this uses a CSS renderer and it allows you to be able to render any sort of iframe in WebXR. Uh, it is a little bit slower, so that's something to keep in mind, but it is really helpful for doing quick mockups and then also just there's a bunch of functionality if you needed some sort of temporary uh, login screen or you needed to connect to some sort of web service. It's it's a very helpful to know how to do that. So it has a lot of utilities, but it is a little bit non-performant just as a warning. <laughs>
So for iframe, the code is a little bit different. We have to use a CSS 3D renderer to get the iframe to be in the scene. And so basically we start in a similar way where we just define a render, but then we also have to create a CSS scene and a CSS render. And then we will attach our render to the CSS render and then attach that to the body of our scene. Then we will define an element creator that will just create the element of an iPlayer. This iframe would normally be an iframe div, but but for the YouTube API, which we are using, we need to define it as a div and with a script that we get from YouTube that will transform it into an iframe. And then we have to define, give this div to a CSS object that we will uh, add to our scene and we will position it. We have to scale it as well. So these will be around the same size as a video, which means that it'll be around like a thousand by a thousand. And so we need to scale that down so that it's more reasonable size for the dimensions of the real world. Then we will do a lot of the, this is a lot of the YouTube API. So if you wanted to do an iframe that is not the YouTube API, you just go put it through here and that's pretty much it. It's a fairly straightforward piece of code. So if you're doing WebXR, there's a lot of kind of standard code that ends up being used quite a bit. So this first part is something that just kind of reconfigures the session initialization. So it can just kind of edits a few things and makes sure a few things are there um, so that you don't end up crashing. And then the next part is going to be the initialization that we end up doing. So on session start is the function that gets called when we are starting up our session. So basically just removes the button and the main part that's important is the request session. We have the closing function, which we're, we were not really going to use. And then we have an initialization call. This next part's a little bit important where it shows the options or the optional features. And so you can either require features or have optional features, but a bunch of the things that WebXR does, you have to call through these things. So you have to make an extra request and then it'll start attaching things to different objects in WebXR. And so it's important to just kind of pay attention to this section. Uh, and then we have our on X frame uh, call. So this is what does all of our animations and this is what's called every single time our WebXR scene runs. So yeah, and then we just have a rendering function that will just render for us. Uh, and then we just add our button to start the um, WebXR. And all of them have a similar structure to this. If we we have to do updates for them, we will put the updates in the WebXR frame. So there's two major extensions that I want to make to this these projects. And so the first one is introducing some sort of asynchronous CD where or some sort of networking where either through long polling or web sockets kind of can connect to other people or connect to extra information. And so this extra level of connection, I think we will focus on next week or the week after. And then the other thing that I wanted to focus on is we were mostly just using static, like our objects were not moving. There was a lot of, we, we we just had sort of a static thing going on. And so I think we will also be working on doing different controllers. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can control objects. It's pretty exotic. There's a very large number. So we'll probably just limit it to the more useful ones. But I also wanted to cover control aspects to AR.